Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word. I pray, Lord, that you bless the preaching of your word and help us to take heed of your words in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look at verse 7 and 8. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. The title of my sermon this morning is The Love of a Mother. The Love of a Mother. Despite the persecutions that uh, the apostles endured, preaching the gospel, going from city to city, going to the Jews, they get persecuted. They kept on going to preach the gospel, even to the Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonians. So they still preach the gospel to more Gentiles, despite uh, or to more Gentile cities, despite all the persecutions they got in uh, previous cities. They could have easily put their hands up and said, you know what, we're done, we've tried, the seeds that we've sown is enough, those ones should go and preach the gospel, you know, and continue to grow uh, the, the, uh, of, uh, for that the kingdom of God. Paul was stoned and left for dead. In fact, that could have been a turning point in many people's lives because he was left for dead, so he assumed that he was already dead, so God gave him new life, so he can live his own life now. He has lived his life for the Lord, <laughs> and he was killed for it, and now, just as Jesus rose from the dead, and went to the Father, so people can make up excuses, but no, Paul stood up and continued preaching. It was early on in his, uh, in his ministry that he was stoned and left for dead. It wasn't at the end. Uh, uh, of his ministry is what I think it was the first journey that he was stoned and left for dead. So he went on the second journey, even the third journey. So, uh, and that, that's a foolish thinking, by the way, to say, oh, that's a good stopping point because of what you're experiencing. But they correctly, the apostles, they correctly viewed it as a privilege to be persecuted for the, uh, for the Lord, for the furtherance of the gospel. In verse 4, the Bible says, but as ye, sorry, but as we were allowed of God, that means we were allowed of God. It's not everyone that God will allow to go through this. In fact, Paul wanted to go and preach uh, further up north, uh, Asia Minor, and God stopped him. The Holy Spirit resisted him and told him not to go and preach there until he heard the Macedonian call. So God was taking him somewhere else. So they were allowed of God, and let's keep reading there. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, so God trusted them with the gospel, as God has trusted us with the gospel, to preach the gospel to the world, to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. So God is the one that's going to judge us, is going to try our hearts, what we're doing, and not just going to look at the outward appearance or, you know, our words only, but our hearts. And which is why Jesus tells us to rejoice in persecution. And I have to open here, but in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5 verse 10, the Bible says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven he goes on to say blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you so God is Jesus saying blessed are you when you are persecuted that means it's a privilege, it's an honor for you to be persecuted because you'll be blessed, you'll receive rewards. So we are blessed to be given the opportunity to earn rewards. The apostles rejoiced, look at what the Bible says, rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. Oh, God is counted, I'm worthy to suffer for Christ? I mean, with all the evil I've been doing, with all the wrong, God is still using me? Thank you, O Lord. That's what they were rejoicing for, that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. And that means they'll earn a reward. Because not everyone has counted worthy to suffer for Christ. It's not everyone that is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Yes, you get saved, but you put your hand on the, on, on the hole on the, and look back on the plow and look back. Call it hole. <laughs> but you put your hand on the plow and look back. You're not fit for the kingdom of God, as the Bible says. All right, so this brings us to the compa uh, comparison with the love of a mother. In verse 7 and 8 that I just read in the beginning, the Bible says, but we were gentle. Gentle means to be kind, to be benevolent. We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children, as a mother taking care of an infant. That's how the apostles were gentle towards uh, the, the Gentile believers that just got saved. 
So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only. It's not just that we brought you into this world and we gave birth to you and we gave you food, you know, food and raiment, you know, there we'd be content, right? But that's not all that they were willing to do, but also our own souls because ye were dear unto us. So all that we are, we poured ourselves into you. That's what Paul is saying. Teaching you how to live your life, how to grow as a believer. It's not just, oh, we got you saved, we're just moving on. No, we're pouring ourselves onto you. All the doctrines, how to live your life and all of that because we're built upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. So mothers go through pain and sorrow in childbearing. Open to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 verse 21. And as you open there, the Bible says in Genesis, God, that's the curse that was put upon uh, Eve and mothers, says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. You know, it's, it's labeled as a curse God put upon women or upon, uh, yeah, mothers. But if you look at it, it's kind of like a blessing at the same time. Because God is saying you're going to be fruitful and you're going to multiply. So some people, many people rather go through that than, you know, not uh, go through that. Let me put it that way. So advances in the medical field have not yet erased the suffering of, uh, of childbearing, right? So they've not removed this suffering yet. And God says, I would multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In John 16 verse 21, as I told you to open there, this is what Jesus said. A woman, when she's in travail, had sorrow. Travail, that she's in labor at that point. She had sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into this world. So the mothers, mothers look forward to the reward, to the end of it. After going through nine months of pregnancy and giving birth to a child, they're looking for, oh, I'll have a child and I'll raise a child. And this is like what we do for the gospel. We're suffering. We go out there. We go preach the gospel. We go uh, lead people to Christ. Go through thick and thin, cold and, uh, and hot, wet and dry, just to preach people the gospel. And we're happy that someone is saved, right? But imagine if that child, if that child tells the mother, oh, I don't care what you did for me. It is God that created me. God created me in the womb, so I don't, what you did is nothing. It's God that made me. How do you think? How, how, would that, how is that mother supposed to think? That's despising the mother, despising all that the mother did for, for the child, and that's disregarding the mother, as the Bible says. So a child saying, oh yeah, because you think you know, oh yeah, I know the Bible, you know, God created me, so... Uh, what you did for me is nothing. It's God I gave you the strength to do it. It's God I did so it's only God. No, you have to still praise your mother. You have to still honor your mother. You can't despise your mother for just giving birth to you. That alone is sufficient for, uh, for you to honor your mother and not disregard your mother. The Bible says in Proverbs 15 verse 20, Proverbs 15 20, I'll just read a few of them. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother like i said a foolish man because yeah when you're a child yeah children foolishness is bound in the heart of a child right but when you're a man then wow you are actually foolish if you despise your mother it means you lack understanding you are still childish and bible says also in proverbs 23 verse 22 hearken unto thy father that begat thee and despise not thy mother when she is old that means you two are older and you two you should be wiser you should have put away childish things you should understand that it wasn't easy for your mother to give birth to you and keep you alive. Children are trying to kill themselves every day. And the mother is <laughs> trying to save the children from killing themselves every single moment of the day. Um, so honor your mothers. Amen. Children are blessings. They are the reward of the Lord. That's something the mother was looking forward to, the reward, and she forget the anguish. Just as we have forgotten what we went through yesterday. Some of us, I believe. <laughs> You know, we're ready to do it again today, right? Amen? All right, so, but God gives us children. That means, remember verse 4, we're allowed by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're allowed by God to have these children. So it's God that gives children as God entrusts us with the gospel. In Genesis 30, Genesis 30, I'll just read this. 
Genesis 30 verse 1, and Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children. Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. Pause there. Jacob loves Rachel so much. So for the fact that he's angry at her, that, you know, that tells a story on its own. But Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and, said, and he said, Am I in God's stead who had withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? So obviously, it was, it's an obvious thing. Okay, God is the one that is withholding the fruit of the womb, and therefore it is God that gives children. Eventually, in verse 22, the Bible says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb. Right? So then God opened her womb, and she's fit to have children. Nine months pregnancy and labor is no small task. It's not a small thing. It's not an easy thing. For that alone, mothers should be honored but they do even much more, right? They impart their souls. They pour out them, themselves to their children. That, and that is in verse 8, as you can see. So the love of a mother is a natural phenomenon, right? Mothers give their all for their children. Just like a mother hen takes care of her chicks, and I can never forget that because of my experience. I've told that story before. I don't have to go into that story again. But just like a she bear will take care of her cubs, Right? When I see cubs of a bear playing around, I don't go to play with the cubs of a bear, right? <laughs> because the mother bear, I come out of nowhere, and she doesn't, she'll first maul you, then ask you what was going on, you know? <laughs> but even mothers, they fight off criminals when it comes to their children. They'll put their lives on the line. Yes, my wife doesn't like snakes, but I'm sure if my if snake is next to my child, she's going there to protect my child, right? Because that child also. So mothers put their lives on the line, things they don't like. They don't know how to swim, but they'll jump into the, the, the pool to save the <laughs> child. <laughs> so, and everyone dies, you know? Like it's, it's just that natural phenomenon to take care of their children. But it's, as I said, it's much more. It's imparting even their own souls. All that they are, they point into their children. Uh, King Solomon's judgment, if you remember King Solomon's judgment in 1 Kings, his judgment between two harlots, right, shows the love of a mother. The harlots that had the child that was alive, they were fighting for, was choosing rather to lose the ownership of her child in order not to see the death of her child. You can read the story. But she's like, oh yeah, don't, don't part him, just give it to her, let her have the child. She will see the child from afar, knowing that the child was stolen from her. She was ready for that. This is thinking on the spot. It, it was just natural. Oh no, just leave, let my child leave. And she was ready then to see her child die. And that is from a harlot, a bastard child. She probably doesn't even know the father. And she was still willing to keep her child alive. That also pictures how God comforts us, right? Open to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49 verse 13. Isaiah 49 verse 13. Because God comforts us, or the comforting of God to us is pictured as a mother taking care of her children, nursing her children. The Bible says, in Isaiah 49 verse 13, Sing, O heavens, and be ye joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Verse 14, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Then this is God's response in verse 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child? That, I mean, if you're saying God has forsaken me and God has you know, forgotten about me, can a mother forget her, her sucking child? It's a natural thing. It's, it's, it's a dumb question. Of course not, right? It, it should be natural that a mother shouldn't forsake her sucking child. I mean, he's a baby. He cannot help himself. He cannot sustain himself. And so it goes on to read. Let me finish up. Can a woman forget her sucking child, verse 15, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. So in as much as it's a natural thing, and we know all these natural things, there are always exceptions, and we're going to look at that. But God's love transcends even the natural phenomena of a, of a mother, of the love of a mother, taking care of the child. Because, and it's still comparable because the natural things are the ideal. So God is like, if a woman can't forget her child, then don't say I've forgotten you. But even if she does, you say, oh, but there's that one woman that forgot her child. But don't worry, God will never forget us, that's his children, right? So, yeah, they may forget. That is scary. And folks, those scary times are here. 
They're already beginning. Those scary times that women are forgetting their sucking child, right? That the love of the mother has dissipated. It doesn't exist anymore. The harlots of the days of King Solomon wanted to save their children, but the harlots of today want to kill them in the womb. You say, oh, why are you calling them harlots? Yes, they're harlots. See, if it quacks like a duck and, and looks like a duck, it's a duck. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 7 verse 9, Proverbs 7 verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, right? So to paint that picture, right? Verse 10, and behold, they met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. I need not to describe it. We all know the attire of a harlot. The Bible doesn't even go to describe it because everyone knows. It's a normal thing. So they met him a woman with the attire of a harlot. See this? And subtle of heart. That means she was cunning. She has a purpose. She knows why she's dressing that way. She knows why she's out there that way. Verse 11. She is loud. Look, I mean, she's loud and stubborn. Her feet abided, abide not in her house. Oh, I want to go out. I'm going there. I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to this in the night. Then she's out. She doesn't stay at home. Right? Verse 12. Now she's without. Now in the streets. And lies in wait at every corner. So she's a whore. At best, she's a harlot. So I was going with at best. Right? At least she's getting money for what she's doing. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. I'm using the words of the Bible. If you read Ezekiel, and I could just go into that, but it takes so much time. In Ezekiel, God was telling Israel, uh, Judah, you're, you're a whore. Like people are you're being used by other nations and other gods. You're not even a harlot that would take money back. Like God was rebuking them and telling them, even a harlot is better. But you're a whore. So she's a whore at best. She's a harlot. And the harlot of these days, they're killing their children in the womb. Compared to the harlot of the days of King Solomon. Where she's fighting for her child. They go to the king fighting for the child. Because one of the children died by mistake. Right? So one slept on top of the child. So I wonder how the harlots of these days feel about Mother's Day. Mm. <laughs> when they want to kill the, wo the child in the womb, how do they feel about Mother's Day? So the coming overturn of Roe v. Wade, that's Roe versus Wade, does not even end abortions and look at them going foaming at the mouth the wicked the the harlots the fools all of them foaming at the mouth oh, they want to kill us they want to kill women like literally they're saying they want to kill women and uh more could be done to end abortion roe v wade what what is happening or the overturn of roe v wade is the supreme court they were wrong at first saying that it, it's a rights issue that women, you should not restrict abortion. Women can do anything they want to do with their body. That is not a right. Abortion is not a right like freedom of speech is a right. Amen? So now they're saying, let the state handle it. It's not a right. Anything you want to do in your states, do it. So they haven't even overturned abortion. They haven't said, okay, abortion, no more abortion. It's up to the state, just like Texas. Amen? For Texas. I don't know if PA will follow suit, but... <laughs> but Texas hasn't even ended abortion. It's just late-time abortion. Right? And these people are forming at the mouth as if we want to kill them or want to kill all women. See, abortion is literally murder and should be illegal. To conceive is to be with child. That's what the Bible says. And I'll show you. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Isaiah 7, verse 14, we're talking about the love of a mother. Amen? The love of a mother. And without the love of a mother, that natural affection of a mother, how are we supposed to celebrate Mother's Day when they don't even want to be mothers? They don't have that natural thing, natural phenomenon of taking care of a child that the Bible uses to explain the love that God has towards us, that the Bible uses to explain how we should go uh, winning souls and taking care of the souls and discipling them and making them trees. Amen? So that they can bring forth fruits also. In Isaiah 7 verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So that passage or that verse was repeated in Matthew 1 23 by the Holy Spirit. And this is what the Holy Spirit said. Behold, Matthew 1 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Right? In Isaiah 7 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive. So, when is the conceiving? The conceiving is as soon as the egg, the sperm fertilizes the egg, right? Then she has conceived. The Bible calls that being with child. 
right? Shall be with child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So the Holy Spirit explained it to us to conceive, to have that fetus, as science has now called it, you know, fetus is a child, whatever they want to call it, a lump of cells, a clump of cells. I am a lump of cells and a clump of cells. Does that mean I, you, anyone can kill me <laughs> and not be charged? right as mother right oh you see but that the person the child or the thing the fetus the lump of cells is insustainable it cannot sustain itself so it's relying on us so therefore we have the right to kill it an infant baby a baby that's just born cannot sustain himself if you leave him he'll die <laughs> so does that give you the right to kill the baby is that no murder so anyhow you want to cut it and dice it it is murder right no, oh, you say, but it, it, it's not it's not their body, it's my body. No, no, no. The, the, that lump of cells, you're calling lump of cells or fetus, it's it has its own body. The blood of the mother never mixes with the blood of the baby. You say, Oh, there's this one scenario where the blood of the mother because of surgery or something. Okay, men don't fly. But if you see a guy jump and has <laughs> glide and it's flying, you say, Oh, but guys are flying. Something has to be done on an ideal situation. The blood stays separate. This is a different human being living in your body. So that human being has rights. Amen? So it's a particular lifestyle, right? It's a particular lifestyle that causes the want for abortion. And what is that lifestyle? Fornication. Have you noticed no one is talking about fornication? It's just assumed that fornication is a normal thing. But it can be, a, a, the, the baby can be a, prevented by abstinence abstinence from fornication but no they want to be irresponsible they want to be promiscuous it's already a given they sacrifice their children for their pleasures that reminds me of giving burning your child or sacrificing your child to Moloch in the bible oh i want to get a good uh, harvest i want pleasures in life i want the goods of this life so they sacrifice their children to Moloch so that Moloch could bless them you can rephrase that to mammon, you can rephrase that to anything, but it's for the pleasures of this world. But no one wants to talk about fornication when it comes when it has to do with abortion. It has been accepted as a social norm, giving contraceptives to high school students. In fact, colleges, another thing you do in colleges is just sowing your wild oats. That's what they do. That's just what it's talked about. So that's just what it is. So hence. Instead of the battle to be in the forefront about fornication, the battle is now about abortion. Right? No, listen to people talk about abortion. No one talks about fornication. Why can't you just prevent it? They say, no, but if you have the child, then you shouldn't kill the child, the child's right. But I don't want the child, well, then, then don't fornicate. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> now you, there's this one or two people talk about incest or talk about different things, you know, be ab abuse. But that is the minority. That is it's so rare. Most people that are pushing for abortion is about fornication. So, no one is forcing you to have the baby. We're just saying, aborting a baby is murder. That's just what we're saying. That's what the Bible says. Amen? And since it is murder, it should be illegal. So, oh, why is it, it should be illegal? It's just like drinking. You know, the Bible says, you know, drinking is foolish and is, you know, is a sin. But it doesn't mean that the government should tell you that uh, you should go to jail for drinking if you just take a sip of alcohol. That's right. No, it's different from alcohol. Because in the Bible, the government is supposed to take care of those that commit murder. Right? So, it is the government's duty to be the punisher of the evildoers. Romans chapter 13. Read the Bible about murder. So we have to establish first that it is murder, but they don't want to establish first that the fetus is a living thing. As far a living thing. To them is a parasite. Right? So they don't want to establish. But if you see half of that clump of cells in Mars, we found life in Mars. <laughs> right. Wow, we found life in Mars. You know, a complex human being that is so wonderful that, wow, I mean, this shows that science just will go just because they find a trace of that cell. In fact, a miscarried baby, blood and stuff in Mars, they say they found life in Mars. Mm -hmm. right. Not to talk of a fetus that is growing in someone, a whole body. So, even going back further, let's go back further, the problem is the lack of the fear of God. Mm -hmm. It's the lack of the fear of God. Open to Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Babies are created by God. 
And that's something they don't want to understand. In Psalm 139, Psalm 139, the Bible says, I will praise you, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So when they don't want to think that God is the one that created the babies and made the babies, made all of us fearfully, that which with reverence which reverence and wonderfully made we're not just we're not just like animals right or beasts as the bible calls them so we are human beings made in the image of god so we're fearfully and wonderfully made and therefore we should praise the lord but they don't fear god they don't praise god so therefore they don't think they're fearfully and wonderfully made right bible says in jeremiah 1 5 before i formed thee in the belly so it's already established god is the one in the belly he didn't say oh i made you in heaven Right? Stupid doctrine. I made you in heaven and I just put you in, 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 in the, in the um, mother's womb. Or uh, when you come out of the mother's womb, then that's when I formed you as we are coming out and stuff like that. No. In the belly, God was the one forming. Right? But he said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew thee. That means you are unique. You are unique. It, it, it's not just a line of babies coming and it's just like, oh, when it comes out, I give them something, you know, I, I now tell them what they are supposed to do. They, they think it's like a manufacturing line out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they think babies are. No, every single child, remember, I already established in the beginning that God is the one that opens the womb. God is the one that gives, the ch gives children. And now God is saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That means you're unique. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I have set you apart. I have given you a purpose. So every child has a purpose. Oh, but he has Down syndrome. Hey, every child has a purpose. Amen. Every child has a purpose. That word of God still stands. I believe the word of God. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. That was for Jeremiah, right? And we to ordain the prophet unto the nations, to the whole world, to preach the gospel. Amen? So, babies are not just copy and paste, as they believe. So, I just get rid of this one. We'll have another baby. See, that other baby is not the same baby. Unfortunately, my wife and I, we had a miscarriage, right? And we don't think the next baby that came out is just the same baby. It's a different body. No. It, it, every, each sperm, right? Sperm cell and egg combines to create a unique person, right? That person has never existed before and will never exist again. That unique person that was just aborted or, or that just came together, that fetus has never existed before and will never, if it came out, you see that fingerprint, no one ever had it and no one will ever have it. A soul, that person is a soul that will either go to heaven or hell. Yes. Oh, but it was aborted. That means it doesn't, you know, it counts. As soon as you're conceived as a child and all babies go to heaven, right? So that soul will either go to heaven or hell depends on how long he lives and if he believes or not and that soul will last forever it, it, because it's aborted it doesn't mean that's it you're never going to see the soul again no it's in heaven saying God God I didn't get a chance to get rewards I mean it's crying thank God for the blood of Jesus that said better things than the blood of Abel as the Bible says so but you know what that blood is crying for vengeance and that is righteous amen so think about that you know if this was Psalms you say Selah or Selah you know, I, I, when I was a kid, I read in Psalms, I didn't know what Sila meant. Now I know it's like a music thing to say end of passage or something. But I used to think Sila meant, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> read, no, okay, go back and read Psalms. Anytime you see Sila, it's like, it's like a huge doctrine was just dropped. It's like, you know, it's like mic drop kind of thing. <laughs> you know, that's what Sila was like. Think about that. Anyway. So think about that when you're thinking about it's a unique person that will never exist and uh, never existed before and that will never exist again. Either go to heaven or hell, that means the soul is eternal. Amen? So what power and privilege has God given us? Has God given mothers, to entrusted mothers to carry that? What power and privilege? Where is the love? of mothers where is the love of a mother open to job chapter 39 job chapter 39 verse 13. now the pro-choice group is the extreme you know i went to the extreme first just to show you the love of mothers whoa it's really going but let's not forget our ostrich mothers also right there are ostrich mothers out there you know you know it's not only pro-choice mothers out there you know the mothers that bury their eggs in the sand and hope for the best Literally. The Bible says in Job 39, Job 39 verse 13. Now, this part of Job, God is responding. You know, God is telling Job, you know, gird up your loins like a man. Listen to what i got to tell you. You know, you're, you're there complaining, oh, oh, suffering. I, I can do anything I want to do. 
I'm God. Right? And it's not boasting. It's not being proud. God cannot boast because... <laughs> I mean, he, he does it. He does everything. He deserves all the glory, all the honor. Anyway, let me get to this. So, verse 13, Job 39, God goes on to say, Give us thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks. Are you the one that beautified the peacocks? Or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Did you give the ostrich wings and feathers? Yes, they don't fly, by the way. <laughs> so, God, that's what, that's the, 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 with knowledge, you understand what God is saying. Which leaveth, so we're talking about the ostrich now, verse 14, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in the dust and forgetteth that the fruit may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. So she, she gives or uh, hatches, the, uh, not hatches, she give, brings for the egg and hides it in the dust that's in the ground. And you know where ostriches are, like in the wilderness kind of place, savannah or something like that. So she hides it in the ground where any beast of the field can come and trample upon it. Oh, but ostriches are still here. Unfortunately, <laughs> but that's the whole example. God has put a, um, a stumbling block for people. Say, oh yeah, but there's still ostriches. That means all ostrich eggs did not break. Yes, but some do break. So do you want your own children to break? Is that what you want? I mean, <laughs> you, you could be that percentage that beasts will crush them and wild beasts might break them. Bible goes on to say in verse 16, she's hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Did you see that? Hardened. Her heart is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. We're not talking about the pro-choice people here now. This one gave birth, <laughs> right? This one hid the egg. But it's not wise enough. The Bible's going to go on to say that. But these ones are not wise enough. They're just, oh, this is how I treat my eggs. This is how I treat my children. Where's the love of a mother? They don't have the wisdom. But this, are, this is a beast, ostrich. God is showing, you created this beast as an example to teach us a lesson about foolish mothers. So she's hurting against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. What, should, what, what are we supposed to fear? The word of God? The, the dangers, what God has warned us that will happen, right? And her labor is in vain. What labor? To give birth to the egg, to dig the hole, put the egg, cover it in the dust. All that labor is in vain because she does not fear the Lord. So what labor will man be doing? Oh, I'm going to take my child to the best schools, to the best daycare, to the best nanny, to the best this. I'll buy them the best toy, the best dad, the best. All your labors are in vain if you don't fear the Lord. And God has a commandment for mothers, which is a natural thing, a natural phenomenon. Amen. Verse 17. Because God had deprived her of wisdom. You see that? So the ostrich is lacking wisdom and is intentional. The beasts of the field were created for us. Right? So the ostrich is just a lesson for us. Simple. Because God had deprived her of wisdom, neither had he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifted up? Up herself on high, she scorned the horse and his rider. So it's that same person, right, that has committed abortion how many times? And that same person that has put the child in this best school and that best school and bought the best thing and bought the best thing. We see a woman that is taking care of her children, the godly way, in the fear of God, and she'll think that she's better than that woman. Is that same ostrich? You know why? Because have you seen an ostrich before? It's probably taller than myself. Yeah, ostriches are huge. <laughs> they're tall so the horse and the rider is quite high you know have you heard of get off your high horse the saying that means pride fool she she's looking down on the horse and the rider that's how huge the ostrich is the ostrich is really tall can run too and so he's looking down on the horse and the rider so be careful the ostrich don't be the ostrich parent send sending their children to the world to raise them that is like hiding your child in the dust your, the eggs in the dust and you know when they hatch and the child is you know growing the egg is forming and all of that that's how it demand the mind of a child is growing and it can be broken it can be destroyed and that child can be destroyed in this world so there, I, I've only seen examples of women that give birth to their children six days old they send that child to daycare six days that's the earliest I've said six days old they send the child to daycare because she has to go to work 
because she has to go to work. Now, I'm talking about the ideal situations. I know if you're a single mother, it's very different. I'm talking about, and I've preached about this. I'm, when I'm preaching the Bible, I'm talking about ideal situations. A man and his wife, family's going on well, and but they want more, greed, all of that. But there are certain situations where, I mean, it is what it is. Because of your life circumstance and situation, you will suffer. And you might have to be like the ostrich mother, which is not what God wants for us. But hey, remember, in the same job, God can do anything he wants to do. So, in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 3, Lamentations 4, verse 3, I'm going to read this. The Bible says, Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people is become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. So, the sea monsters, who are the sea monsters? Those are the whales, right? The sea monsters, they draw the breast. They are mammals, by the way. So, <laughs> so God knows, I mean, science agrees with the Bible. That, that's how it should go. It's not the other way around. If not, it's the science falsely so called. All right. So the sea monsters, they breastfeed. They, they take care of their babies. They even, like, they even draw the breast for their young ones. That's what the Bible is saying. But the daughter of my people is become cruel. That means this new generation of Israel, or, or Lamentations, that's Judah, of Judah, they are cruel. They are wicked. They are hardened against their young ones. They are like the ostriches in the wilderness. Isn't that the same person that wrote the Bible? The Holy Spirit. That's who wrote the Bible. It's like they just remember that. Like so breastfeeding is becoming a thing of the past. Where is the love of a mother? It's a thing of the past now. Many people, in fact, the best people would do and say, Oh yeah, I'm doing much. Because science have told them breast milk is good because it has the uh, what do you call that? Immunity, there you go. It has immunity in, inside to help the baby, right? So it has immunity, it has some nice vitamins. And it's not just a uh, bottle feeding that doesn't have that natural immunity in it. So mothers know that now. And so science have taught them the best thing to do is for them to pump the milk. Like at work, in workplaces, in many places at work, you see a room. It's called the mother's room. Do you know what that room is for? Pumping milk. <laughs> I'm dead serious. <laughs> if you go to offices, many, not even high-end offices, becoming a norm. I design many of those things. So uh, it's just a table, a chair, uh, a socket, an outlet, just for your understanding, an outlet, and that's it in the, in the room for pumping breast milk. Why don't you just go home and feed the baby? Mm. Why don't you just take that time out? Feed the baby, that closeness. Even the doctors will tell, as soon as you're born, the doctors put the baby with the mother. So that the mother, that, that closeness, that warmth, so the mother gets used to the baby and the baby gets used to the mother. But now they just pump it, put it in a bottle, so he gets used to the bottle quickly, you know? Because I can't be doing this forever. <laughs> so he gets used to the bottle. Let, let, let's, let's get him on, on bottle quickly because it's so inconvenient to breastfeed the baby. So um, how can they impart their souls to their children when they're not even there? And they think they're doing so great by giving them the immunity in the breast milk. That's just by pumping it. So they are not with them in the prime of the day, which is when the child is learning, the child can grasp things. They are not with the children, instead the children are somewhere else. They are tired at the end of the day, so when they come back from work, they're tired. Guess who is even more tired? The baby, the child. The child is not trying to learn anything at the end of the day. You two are so tired to teach the child. <laughs> so you know, I'll just correct everything that was wrong. That's wrong. That, that, that is not God's way. Let's put it that way. So the children too are tired. And by the time they're teenagers and young adults, and now you have the time to talk to them, it's too late. Mm. It's too late. They've already formed their beliefs and their foundations are formed. Right? So it's too late at that time. And the mothers end up regretting and suffering what they have raised. You say, oh, but I didn't raise this child. Exactly. You didn't raise the child. <laughs> So, uh, who, who, I, didn't, I didn't teach my child this thing. Exactly. You should have taught your child something. There's no vacuum, right? Vacuums are always filled up. So if you don't fill the child up with the right things, it's always the wrong things that will fill it up, right? So the children might not be dead sacrifices to Molech. They might not have been aborted, like the pro-choice people. They might not be dead sacrifices to Molech, but guess what they are? They are living sacrifices to Molech. Yeah. They are living sacrifices. They've, the children have sacrificed to Moloch already. Their lifestyle, what they believe, to the certain point that the Bible even says uh, that the children will give up their parents even to the death. They are living sacrifices to Moloch. Just we are supposed to be living sacrifices to the Lord. And Moloch, there, I'm talking about the prince of Persia or prince of America, the, 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 the rulers of wickedness and high places. We don't fight against flesh and blood. 
right? Because I remember Obama saying, this was a while back, saying, oh, women, we have to get women back to work. We, we're going to pay for daycare and all of that. Do you know why they want to get women back to work? Fast and soon? And they'll pay for daycare and give you tax back. Give you your money back. By the way, it's not like they're giving you... Anyway, let's, let's move on from taxes. So they'll g get money back and all of that. Do you know why? Just to increase the GB, uh, GDP. Because more women walk in. I mean, look at after the industrial age, America just, phew, economy blew up. Because the women were walking. More women walking. So it's about money. It's mammon. Don't sacrifice your children to mammon. The love of a mother is sacrificial. The prime of her life is sacrificed. Her body is sacrificed, her money-making potential. Yes, women have money-making potential. They can break that glass ceiling, right? Her money-making potential, uh, strides in her career, all that has been sacrificed because that is the prime of her life. Her strength, her sleep, her thoughts, everything is sacrificed for that child. She's pouring her soul, her, her, her whole life into that child. If you notice, the prime of her life coincides with childbearing and rearing age. That's the prime of a woman's life. The childbearing and rearing age, uh, years, she sacrifices all that. To ch Why do you think God put it that way? If, no matter how science wants to deny it, that time, those years, are the prime of a woman's life. And this is exactly why she, she's priceless. A, wom a, a virtuous woman. A woman that has the, the love, the, the, the ready to sacrifice, the love of a mother. That is priceless. Open to Proverbs 31. So in Proverbs 31, the Bible says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above ru uh, rubies. And that is why she should be honored. Proverbs 31 verse 28. Look at verse 28 there. Proverbs 31 verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. That is Mother's Day right there. They arise up and call her blessed. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mom. We honor you. We thank you for what you've been doing for us. Because you didn't just only give birth to us, right? You poured out yourself for us. She wakes up very early in the morning before it's bright. In the dark. She's making food. She's doing everything. Very resourceful. So it's not just her children. The Bible goes on to say, her husband also. Oh, husbands are only calling their moms. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, how about your wife? Mm. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to your wife. Her husband also, and he praised her. Right? That is Mother's Day in a nutshell. Husbands, you too. Open to First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five, verse nine. First Timothy five, verse nine. So, the love of a mother is sacrificial. It is what God desires of a mother. Are you God fearing? Or you want all your labor to be in vain because you did it not in fear, as the Bible says about the ostrich. So if you're God fearing, you do what God requires of a mother. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9, and this is grading the life of a woman at the end. What, how does God what, what counts? What is the thing that matters? The Bible says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. So, number one, having been the wife of one man, well reported. Of for good works, if she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had been if she had diligently followed every good work, if she had been the CEO of a company, and if oh, oh sorry, that was not there. Oh. You see, and they're all fighting to be CEO, business owners. No, that's that's not part of the requirements. There's nothing outside, you know, the home and resources for the home. Everything is about the home. Lodging strangers, right? Take him because you might take him, uh, uh, an angel of God might visit you. That's what the Bible says. I mean, look at what Sarah did with Abraham, right? Lodging God and two angels. So, verse 14 goes on to say also, I will therefore that younger women. Okay, so what are the younger women to do? So that's the end, that's the grading for women at the end of their life. What does God say we should check? in the church before we say, Oh, yeah, this is a woman that you know God wants to take care of, right? So but in the beginning, the younger ones, the ones that are not yet uh, married, but what the Bible say? Oh, therefore, the younger women go to college and start. You know, did it, did it say all that? Younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So anything else you're doing out of that. You might give occasion to your adversary to speak reproachfully. Do what God tells you to do first. Or you don't fear the Lord. 
you, you don't fear God. You don't, you don't care what he says. I'm going to do what I want to do because I want to make money, because I want to be this, I want to be that. That's just you, you, you. How about what God has entrusted to you? Church, how about what God has entrusted to us, the gospel? See? The same thing. Love of a mother. So, the highlight of a godly mother is not her career, but her household. Mm. It's not her career, but her household. The Bible says a foolish woman with her own hands would destroy her own house. <laughs> and she's foolish. I don't care how much, how many companies you're the CEO of. Mm. If your house is destroyed, you're foolish. Oh, but I'm so smart. I have these degrees and that degrees and alphabets after my name. Ho hopefully not LGBT alphabet, but... That is foolish because your house is destroyed. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Open to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You're there in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men... Okay, so from this list, I'm, I just want to point out one thing, but I'll add two more things. But one thing I want to point out. So let's go through the list. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. What is the thing I want to point out there is in verse 3, the one thing there is without natural affection. That is the love of a mother. It's a natural thing. It's a natural affection. You don't teach a mother how to love his, the child. <laughs> you know, it's just natural. The mother just wants to give everything. She doesn't think twice when it comes to protecting the child. It's like, oh, just always, you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, did I sleep on the child or something? Like, you know, like, I, I had the baby crying. Oh, no, no, the baby's not crying. It's just in your head. You know, like, or oh, the baby cries and milk starts pouring out. You know, some people don't know anything about that, but <laughs> it's just natural. Natural affection, right? But that is missing in, in the last days. Remember, I already told you, when those perilous times, those scary times when people want to kill their own babies in their own womb, their own babies, right? And there are two things else I want to point out is the lovers of their own selves. Yeah, I love myself so much, I don't want that parasite growing in me. Oh, I love myself so much, I want to have my career, this child or these children, they cannot stop me or hold me down. You know, God is pushing me forward. You know, they can say anything they want to say, but it's lover of their own selves and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Or if you say you love God, I do not see. Uh, sorry, uh, if you say you, you love a brother that I... Sorry. If you don't... I'm trying to phrase it the right way. You cannot say you love God I do not see when you don't love your brother. Not talk of your own child. Right? Uh, so let us use this Mother's Day to revive that natural affection. Mothers and your stripes. Right? It's a lot of work. Yes, but you be, you're honored. And that's what God has called us to, you to do, mothers. Fulfill God's purpose in your life. That's the first thing. You, you love the Lord and you're walking according to his purpose. All things work together for your good. That's what the Bible says. So raise godly seeds. Raise soul winners, not just saved children. Raise men and women beneficial to the society. Not men and women looking for, um, what do they call that thing, if you don't have a job? Money. Sorry? Handouts. Yeah, handouts in general. Welfare. There you go. Looking for welfare. You want money back. That's, that's society. People are uh, children that are being raised. They stay in their parents' house for so long and uh, they don't want to go and be beneficial to society, add to the society, impact their generation. So let's raise children that can do that. And for all of us, revive that natural affection for souls. God is using the love of a, of a mother to explain the kind of love we should have for souls. So, revive that natural affection for souls. Remember the rich man in hell. What did, he, what did he say when he was talking to Abraham? He said, so send Lazarus to go and talk to my brothers. That's how much in hell, by the way. Because people think, oh, when they're in hell now, then you know, all hate will fill them because that's where Satan is. Satan has not even seen hell. <laughs> and they say, oh, it's the Lord of hell. He, he doesn't want to go there. So, which king doesn't want to go to his kingdom? <laughs> so, he doesn't want to go there. He's dreading the day that he will go there. Right? And, okay. So, in hell, people think, oh, they'll just be full of hate and everything. No. Their eyes will be opened. When um, deception and lies have been taken out of the way, the truth will be undeniable. Hmm, good line. Anyway. So, <laughs> the truth will be right there and they'll be like, 
Yeah, we need to get people saved. The guy in hell is thinking of getting people saved. Folks, we're not in hell now, right? <laughs> <laughs> we should be thinking of getting people saved. Do you? Okay, we're not going to hell. We're saved, right? Those of us are saved. We believe, once saved, always saved. By grace, through faith, not of ourselves. The gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. Right. So, we're not going to hell, right? But does God need to take you to hell before you can see that, oh yeah, we should get people saved? But that's what this guy did. This guy was in hell, and he's like, oh, let's, let's get my brother saved. Let's get people saved. Amen? So that veil had been taken away from his eyes. Let that natural affection come. The natural affection came, and he's like, my brothers and my sisters. Which leads me to the next point. Natural affection towards each other. Towards each other. Open to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 40, 48. So Mother's Day, the love of a mother is a natural affection. Let's, re- let's remember these mothers. Yeah, they're doing their own part. They're being honored, and God will reward them. Us too. Let's seize this opportunity. Revive that natural affection for souls. Let's revive that natural affection towards each other. Um, the Bible says, before you, I read Matthew 12, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. This is in First Timothy 5, 1 and 2. Entreat him as a father. So in the church, don't rebuke an elder. Don't talk to older ones like you know they're your mates right entreat him talk to him as a father as you would talk to your father and the younger men as brethren amen as your brother as your mate right in uh, verse 2 the elder women as mothers and the youngers as sisters with all purity so we should treat ourselves like family that's what god is saying right the older ones like the fathers the older women as the mothers Brothers and sisters, the younger ones. So in Matthew 12, verse 48, the Bible says, But he answered and said unto him that told him. Okay, so somebody came and told Jesus, Yo, your mother and your brethren, you know, without, they are calling for you. But Jesus, he answered and said unto them that told him, Sorry. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father. Pause. Because when we think... People think about the will of my father. I say, oh, whosoever is obeying all the commandments, you know, going so winning, um, you know, reading the Bible, not committing, not stealing. Everyone is perfect. Everyone is doing everything that God says in the laws. That's not the will of the father Jesus is referring to. The will of the father is, if you see the son, you believe him. John chapter 6, verse 38 to 40. You can read it. In fact, let's read it. John. Because Jesus made it very clear what his will was. Because people get this confused also in Matthew chapter 7. It's not all that say to me, Lord, Lord, I went into the kingdom of God. But those that do the will of my Father. So what is the will of the Father? In John chapter 6 verse 38 to 40, the Bible says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the, is the Father's will, which had sent me, that all which he had given me, I should, not, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's the will of God. So he said, for whosoever, back to Matthew 12, for whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So you see your brother, he's he's saved, he's going somewhere, going the wrong way. Show love, in love, bring them back, win their souls, right? Like, correct the sinner. That's what I mean. I'm talking about saved people. So in love, correct them, bring them back to joy, provoke one another to love. Because he's your brother, he's your sister, you're going to see them in heaven. Right? People I meet at the door, I know they are saved and I knock and they say, tell me I don't go to church because all churches are wrong and evil. You know, I try to encourage them to come to church, but I know I'm going to see them in heaven with my brother and my sister because they've done the will of the Father. Amen? Amen. In no wise, though, was Jesus disrespecting his mother. You guys say, oh, who is my mother? Who, who are my brethren? He wasn't disrespecting his mother or despising his mother. He was showing that believers are family. You know, you're saying mother and brethren. No, no, no. Believers too are family. Right? So he did not ignore his mother. I believe he, he still went and talked to his mother. But he was trying to use that uh, situation to teach us, basically. Teach his disciples also. In John chapter 19, you can open there. John chapter 19, John 19 verse 25. John 19 verse 25. Okay, I'm almost done. John 19 25, Bible says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, 
When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Open to Matthew 15, last one. But what am I trying to point out with this passage? Jesus was honoring his mother even in death. Jesus did not say, Oh, woman, I'm dying for your sins. This is taking you <laughs> from hell. Right? So I'm dying for your sins. You should be grateful that I'm dying for your sins. Don't, what are you expecting from me? Nothing. Like, I've done. Hey, uh, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. No, that's not what he said. He said, I'm going to take care of you. That's what he's trying to do. He told uh, John to take care of his mother as his own mother. And that was a commandment. That's the word of God. You know, some false apostles and preachers back. Like, oh, the Lord said, you know, I should take care of this. No, never. That this person should take care of me and stuff like that. So, no, no, no. This one, God actually said, John, take care of her as your mother. It's the word of God. It's written in the Bible. Right? So, John took her as the mother. So Jesus was taking care of his mother, honoring his mother even in his death. Even in his death. Because he was no more going to be around. So he had to make sure that his mother was well taken care of. And not thinking, oh, I'm doing so much more for you. You shouldn't even worry about that. So um, it should suffice us to believe that God, Jesus, honored his mother. So let us honor our own mothers. Because in this story, Matthew chapter 15, which is the last, verse 1, the Bible says, Then came Jesus to the scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do, ye, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So he could have picked any example, but this is the example he picked. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that cursed father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So, by any kind of tradition, or, oh, I'm just going to kick them to old people's home. I'm just going to, you know, just forget about them. Oh, they're hungry. Uh, but, see, I'm giving you food. You should be thanking me. What? No. That's, that's not honoring your father and mother. But that's what the Pharisees were teaching. But God pointed that out because that, that was touching him too. That was touching Jesus. Because people were disregarding their father and their mothers. And they're supposed to die the death, as the Bible says. So this was an example for Jesus that he picked out out of all other examples that the Pharisees were doing wrong. But he picked out honoring thy father and thy mother in this instance. So let us heed and remember the love of our mothers. Giving birth to us alone is sufficient for us to honor them. And by honoring them, adults, it's not saying, oh, anything they say you do, you must do. No, making sure that they are, I mean, making sure it's according to the line of God, listening to the advice, and treating them uh, well, talking to them well, and making sure they're well taken care of. That's all. Doesn't mean you have to take them, you know, on vacations and everything, and buy them new house, new car. No, that, that doesn't necessarily mean honoring your parents. I mean, that's overboard. It's just taking care of them. And they don't need much. As they get older, read Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It's not much they need. It's not much that excites them. They're afraid of height, they're afraid of this, afraid of that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, it's, it's not much. But you have to honor your mothers. So let's take heed, let's remember and not despise our mothers. Let's bow our heads.